Good morning, River Church family. I'm Kasia and this is John. We are delighted to bring you the family business this week. Giving Day next week on the 14th, support Revive in their third summer and launch into the next thing that God has for them. Think and pray about the offering and bring it next week. Evening service on the 14th. Prophetic Community, Saturday the 13th at Harvest Centre, 9.30 to 11.30 in the morning. It's a time of equipping and growth in the prophetic gifting. So all who want to join, sign up with Deborah and Martin. That is everything we have for you today. Enjoy the rest of the service as we worship our God together. My message this morning comes from John chapter 20, but I want to start, um, and, and it just goes right along with what God says to us prophetically, the songs that we're singing, um, because the Holy Spirit knows where we are and what we're doing. The, if you want a title for the message, it's this, The Power to Go, Resurrection Power. The power to go, resurrection power. And I want us first to read two verses out of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Now, if you start in verse 15, this is a prayer that I've prayed over this church and over many people through the years. And um, I've prayed this from the early 80s over this church. And we're cutting into the prayer, pr the prayer today. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Very important word there, believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his, at his right hand in heavenly places. Another translation puts it, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and me. That same power that raised him up to the right hand of God. We have that power if we believe. And I think that girl Sarah's testimony proves that to us. And the second scripture, it's about the resurrection power of God. It's one of my favorites in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 20 and 21, both these scriptures come out of what we call the apostolic prayers of the apostle Paul. There are a few more prayers that he prayed too in and through his letters. But here we are. Um, and, and verse 20, um, oh well, and verse 19, with to, and we're cutting in here again, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. There's a power that works within her. That's the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus that can set us free. Verse 21, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To all generations, that includes you and it includes me. We are not powerless, we're powerful. Amen? And we need to live in that power. So turn with me to John chapter 20, and um, it's a great scripture. It's about the resurrection. One of the things about the resurrection is, you know, we can have a lot more people in the church on Resurrection Sunday. In fact, the church in Waco had a thousand more people turned up last Sunday. Not incredible. A thousand people extra into the congregation in one day. Wow. Anyway, but they're very encouraged by it, let me tell you. So in John chapter 20 here, um, and, <clears throat> you know, this is a story of Mary. 
And, you know, they've, they've gone to the empty tomb, and, and Peter and the other disciples, they run, and so forth and so forth. You read it in the first few verses, but for the sake of time, and we're cutting into verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels um, in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus lay, had lain. Then they, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because I've, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. She said, he, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Wow, this is resurrection day. You know, every day is resurrection day. In this story, it's resurrect. Jesus has risen from the dead. One of the first things, well, the first thing that he faces is a woman in deep sorrow. She's so sorrowful that she doesn't even recognize the resurrected Jesus. She thought it was the gardener. She was so deep in sorrow in her heart. And sometimes we can get to a place of deep sorrow in our hearts. And if we allow ourselves to hold on to the sorrows, we won't move on into the power and the resurrection power that God has for us. We need to be people that can rise up. You see, it's so easy to look back and be sorrowful. It's so easy to, you know, um, so often I've heard people say that the abused often becomes the abuser. Someone that's grown up with an alcoholic dad often becomes an alcoholic. We hear stories of these kind of things that repeat themselves. And sometimes we look for somebody to change in, in our lives that causes a lot of pain. But then what we always end up doing is going back for more. And Jesus doesn't want us to do that. He never wants us to do that. It may be, I wrote this comment from verse uh, 15. We may need a bit more weeping in our seeking that we might find greater revelation of the resurrected Jesus. You see, Jesus is not on a cross. <clears throat> If you know Jesus, if you love Jesus, you've been to the cross, okay? And the invitation for you as a believer is not to come back to the cross, but is to go before the throne, because that's where you belong, amen? It says it to us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Now, therefore, let us boldly come before the throne of grace, that we might receive his mercy and find his grace 
to help us in our time of need. So when we're in a time of need, listen to the prophetic words. When you're trapped in the darkness, when you're walking down the stairs and it's dark and fear has gripped your heart, whatever it might be, just know that his robe didn't just fill the temple. It fills the temple. Amen? And he's there in resurrection power because he died for us. And he's given us that power, power to live by. Oh, but you don't know my story. No, you don't know mine. But I know his story. And his story is enough for you and it's enough for me, for us to rise up in these days in the resurrection power of Jesus, believing who he is, believing what he's called us to to do and to step out into it in Jesus' name. So much of the church have tried to tell us, oh, it's not for today. Well, that is not true. I can't find that in the Bible anywhere. All I find in the book of Acts is power to live by. Amen. Amen. Demonstrations of God's power that you and I can live by today. Here's this girl. When I was, her mother told me about her. She was away from the Lord. I remember sending her a tract, sending her a prayer, sending her a handkerchief. And she gets to the place and she rebukes the sickness within herself, rises up healed. Oh, well, that's not been my experience. But do you believe? Are we believers? Are we believing? Or do we qualify everything that we believe and we just run back to the pain when the Lord tells us to forget the former things? Behold, I do a new thing. And he promises rivers in the desert. He promises pools in the wilderness. And that's when we get to the place of overflow in our lives. Because you're the only answer for the world today if you believe in Jesus Christ. You're the only answer for the world today. No matter what problem you look at out there, you are the answer. Oh, your enthusiasm overwhelms me. Amen. You're the answer today in Jesus' name. You have an answer. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The sorrow of the grave. You know, my dad died when he was 58 years old. He never saw any of my successes at all in life because I was pretty successful as a fisherman and all that stuff. But he didn't live to see it. And I would have loved to have seen the smile on his face. You know, Yvonne and I, when we got married, it's a long story, but but I remember taking the plans of the house and laying it across his bed and saying, look, Dad, look at this. But he didn't live to see it. I got sore. You know, I could allow that sorrow to hold me back from what God has got for me in the rest of my life. But listen, I've traded my sorrows. We sing it, don't we? What do we trade with sorrows for, Marian? Is it? The joy of the Lord. The joy of... Trade your sorrows for the joy of the Lord. Because the Bible says that... you You better smile at this one. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. So we need to allow the joy of the Lord to encourage us in the midst of our sorrows. She went from the sorrow of the grave with a message that would save. She went from sorrow with a message to the world that he is risen. Ladies, she was the first missionary. She was, a, oh, don't sound so excited about it, ladies, but she was the first missionary. Amen? Before any disciple got a hold of it, she was the one that came and declared resurrection power in Jesus' name. Amen? She wanted what she had. She came to the grave to get with more, with more um, um, ointment for his body. She wanted what she had. Yet Jesus gave her her something new. 
and he wants to give us something new. If you're in a prison today, he wants to set you free because it's for freedom that we're set free today in Jesus' name. You know, don't let the enemy rob you from the best that God has in these days in Jesus' name. And Jesus gave her hope. He gave her revelation. He gave her encouragement. He encouraged her faith. He gave her resurrection life. She had come with spices to preserve his body. Jesus sent her to his body. The fledgling church wasn't even birthed yet. He gave Mary the motivation to go and do what he had called her to do. Why? Because his word is true. As we believe Jesus, his word is true. Amen? Have you ever said this? My get up and, and, and go has got up and left. <laughs> Who's ever said that? You're a liar if you don't put your hand. No, no. Have you, you ever said that? You know, we feel like that sometimes. That's when we call on the resurrection power that is within us. A guy called Bill Johnson said, sometimes... The Holy Spirit is trapped inside unbelieving believers because that's where he lives. Jesus said very, very clearly in John chapter 14 from verse 16 to 18 that he, Jesus said, I'm going to give you another helper. I'm going to give you another one like me. And he is not only going to be with you, but he is going to be in you forever. Say that word forever with me. Forever. forever. It's a done deal. Don't let the Holy Spirit be trapped inside, but let the Holy Spirit flow through you for what it is that God has for you in this next season of life in Jesus' name. If there's low-hanging fruit out there, go find it. Go find it. Ask God to show you because he's a God of faithfulness. Amen? Now, the second point here is this, and we've heard it through the prophetic word. It says here in verse 19, then Jesus, the same day, um, then this, uh, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. The doors were shut because of fear. And so often we can allow fear to grip our hearts and stop us being the people that God has called us to be. be. Fear can lock us up. We've heard it already today in the prophetic word. We don't live by fear. We live by faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And fear really works on our feelings because so often we try to live our Christian life through our feelings. And I can't find the track, but there used to be a track. And um, the tra on, the, on the track, there was a picture of a train. And the engine was called Faith. The, and, and, and it was a steam train. So um, where they kept the coal was called truth. And, and that's what fuels your faith. And then the third carriage was feelings. The feelings follow after the faith. Because if you don't feel good, well, you just don't feel good. But if you're not exercising your faith, you'll be stuck in life. And God doesn't want us to stop there. He wants us to grow. He wants us to be a people that get beyond where we are. Living by faith and believing God. That resurrection power that maybe we just need to lay our hands on ourselves and know God's power at work within us because he is a God of faithfulness. And it says here in verse 17, he says to Mary, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go find my brothers and tell him, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And don't you love A.W. Tozer? Oh, I love, you know, you <clears throat> he, he speaks 
I'm sure it was him. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Um, but he, he speaks about when Jesus went into heaven. You know, I always remember when I was trying to become a preacher back in the, in the early 80s. When it early 80s, if I got it right? Yeah. And, and I would say, well, how do, what do I do? And then I read um, Stephen. Stephen's uh, preached to the Sanhedrin. I said, well, maybe if I, if I could preach like Stephen. I learned a lot out of that sermon. I read it so much trying to be a preacher back in the day. And, you know, the tabernacle of Moses was a copy of something that's in heaven. Of he, It was a picture of what was in heaven, and Moses had the blueprint to build the tabern- tabernacle on, on, on the earth. And so what was, part of the, the picture is that once a year, the, the priest, he had a rope around his ankle, and he would walk into the Holy of Holies with the blood the blood of an animal, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat where the seraphim were over the Ark of the Covenant, and he would sprinkle the blood, and God would come down, and he would look at the blood through the wings of the seraphim, and their sin was atoned for for a whole year. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords walked into heaven that day when he ascended with his blood presented his blood to his father. Amen. And when he looks at you and me, he looks at us through the blood. Amen. Can you imagine Jesus holding his hand up before the face of the father? And as as, um, the father looks through the hole in his son's hand, he sees you and me, not how we used to be, but he sees Jesus. Amen. Amen. That'll deal with fear. Just meditate on the picture. And it wasn't a forgiveness from from sin for a year. It was from everlasting to everlasting. We just need to be standing on our chair shouting freedom this morning. Amen. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom in who he is and who he has called us to be as the people of God. There they were. They were locked up because of fear. I'll tell you this story. I was in Irkutsk, Siberia, and we were celebrating 20 years of the church there. And uh, gone there for about 25 years before the doors were shut. And anyway, um, and... um, And my friend Jimmy, Jimmy Seibert, he was being presented because he started the churches out there uh, back in the early 80s, and, um, or the early 90s. And, and, and so he, they were giving him the key to the city. And so they gave him this nice presentation box, and they gave him the key to the city. And at the same time, he was busy on the phone because two of our missionaries in another country were in prison for preaching the gospel. A, a husband and wife and their four children were, were with them in prison. We had to send missionaries out to help them and, and counsel them and, help, and all that stuff. Anyway, as Jimmy's getting presented with the key, the Lord speaks to me and, and said, that's the key to the prison in this other nation. So when the meeting finished, I said, hey, Jimmy, that's the key to the prison, and you and I need to go back to the room and symbolically open that prison door in Jesus' name. There's a lot more we could say about that, and apostles and prof- prophets working together. And, uh, but anyway, we get back to that room. There was four, Peter McDermott was there with us and a few other, couple of other guys. And Jimmy rips this key out of this presentation case. And we're standing there together. I know it looks stupid, but everything's done by faith. And we started to turn the key, and then we're turning the key of the prison in this other nation. Next day, they were released. Next day, they were released. Amen. We were able to break into that, not because, oh, we just do a funny little thing here. No, by faith and believing that God is the one that can set us free. So if you're stuck in a place today, don't be stuck there. But allow that freedom to come. And you can think, oh, what a nice story. How does that fit into my life? Just walk by faith 
and you begin to see God do things that need to be done to help you and encourage you. Amen? He goes into the Father. He reestablishes family, as Sarah had said, multi-generational family on mission together. Gives me goosebumps every time I say it. Um, he he reestablishes family. What the first Adam lost, the second Adam, uh, Jesus reestablishes with his father and our father. Amen. It's reestablished. Not only is reestablishing what uh, what um, um, Adam had lost, but reestablishes it and more, yes. and more that he would give to us. What he is saying of one and we are, the, I, I have one, we are a family and it's sealed in my own blood. Amen. Just take the bread and the wine in the morning. It's a holy thing. Just take it in the morning, any morning, any place that you can, it's just as the Lord speaks to you. As you take the bread, think about it. His body, if you need healing, in your body, receive him. His blood covering you. We sing that song, his blood flows, flows through my veins. Every time you take the cup in remembrance of him, think of his blood flowing through your veins. Amen? Because... He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When he instituted the breaking of bread, he knew what you and I were going to go through in life. He knew everything about us. He knew everything, every sorrow, every fear, everything that would hold us back from the best that he wanted to give to us. And so he says, I'll give you my body and I'll give you my blood. And you know what it spells, the body and blood of Jesus? Freedom! It spells freedom to you and freedom to me. All we have to do is rise up in faith and see God move. Amen? Listen to what John 14, I've alluded to it. Verse 15 to 18 says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now hold on to that, keep my commandments. You're going to need it for the next point. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. I love that word, forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Isn't that amazing? See that last verse there, verse 20? I will not lead you as orphans. One of the shortest version, verses in the Bible. That is the central verse of the New Testament. I will not leave you as orphans. Lots of people live with this thing we call an orphan spirit. You can never be delivered from it. The only way you get freed from it is if it's loved out of you. You know, the first pastor that we had in Elgin, a guy, uh, sorry, and in, in, in Bucky in the church there when it was part of our little movement he, here, um, um, Myron Patterson, his wife worked in the school as a cleaner. And she was cleaning the classroom one day, <clears throat> one day, and she, she was telling me the story. Um, she said, there was a bunch of kids, they all rounded on this little girl. And they started to say, just like kids sometimes do, you are adopted, you are adopted. And they started to cry this out to the girl. And the girl just stood there. And she said, the difference between you and me is I was chosen. <laughs> ah, amazing. Do you know that you're chosen today? Oh, that makes me want to jump up and down because we're chosen. Amen. Now, don't fall, sit there feeling half asleep. I, I got my bed at quarter past midnight. That's not out of pride. But hey, listen, 
The power of the resurrected Jesus Christ lives in each one of us. We've been adopted into a family. We should be, be proud of that in, in one sense. I don't like the word proud of it, but you know, we should be rising up in that calling by which he's called us in these days because he's got things for us to do. Amen. Places for us to go as we continue to flow in the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. He showed, he showed them his hands and his feet, not before he had presented them before the Father. You see, him, it's, it's when, you know, we, we, we've got a prayer that we pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Just see the picture again. As he, as he ascended to his Father, presented his blood that set you and me free for a lifetime and beyond, and he presented his hands and his feet before his Father. The next thing he does, he comes back to earth and presents it to his disciples. It's not an amazing picture, amen? And heaven touched earth. In other words, the kingdom of God had come. But you see, he had 12 disciples and even 120 that took him a long time to believe. It took them 40 days of him appearing to them off and on during that time. And some of them still didn't believe until the day of Pentecost. I'm just excited about the word of God, so. Amen. Okay, number three is this. And I, 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 what did I told you? Tell, that was a phrase I told you to yeah, uh, hold on to. What was it? Believe. Obey. What was it, David? Obey. Obey my commandments, okay? Listen to this next one here. And this is not on the same day, but... Um, yeah, well, yeah, well, let me read verse 20. So when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Many would say that's when, well, it was when they got saved, when they realized about his blood. And here they are. They're now receiving the Holy Spirit. This is the next thing. Remember, obey his commands. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You see, forgiveness is a command. You don't have a choice. You must forgive. Because if you hold on to, I always remember a story. I was, with, I was called out on a New Year's Day to the church in Foggy Lawn, um, Aberherder. And uh, the minister there was, and, and our friend Colin Oliphant at the time, they were ministering to a lady who was demonized, and they couldn't get her free. And so they called me up during lunchtime on New Year's Day to come and help. And so I went there. Who was the minister at that time again? Paul? Bob Jones. I took him to India with me here the craziest of times. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we're, we're praying over this lady, and I said to her, I can see this picture, and I see this chain, and that chain is going into a grave. Who is it that you're grieving over? Oh, it's my mother. When she died, I've never been able to let her go or forgive her for dying. We cut the chain, and she was set free. Amen. You know, my father drank too much in his day. There was a day when I had to forgive alcohol for what it did to him, and cigarettes. You might think that's silly, but hey, I tell you, it works if you obey, obey the commands of Jesus. And so... Forget, you see, it, it's back to the train because, you know, sometimes you go through lots of things and you have to forgive. 
And um, it's back to the train. You do that by faith. You fuel the tra- your faith with the truth of God's word. And then the feelings follow. But if you live by the feelings, your faith can never get beyond them to lead you out of that prison or that darkness or the things that's holding you back from believing God. That's why Jesus made it a command. And let me tell you, um, through forgiving over many situations in my lifetime, and people have had to forgive me too, um, that as you forgive, you find, you know, um, because I can forgive on the command, but the feelings are still there. And so daily sometimes I have to go back to that situation and repeat it again. I forgive that situation. I forgive that person. I release that person from my unforgiveness. And daily, and what you find is that freedom comes the more that you do it and the more. But the thing is that when we say forgiveness, usually what the Holy Spirit does, because he lives within you, a face suddenly comes up and you go, oh, that one. Yeah, that one. That's the one you're called to forgive. And that's where we get to that place of freedom in Jesus' name. She's groaning in the Holy Spirit today in Jesus' name. And it happens all the time, you know. Okay, let's bow our heads. Who is it that you need to forgive if you're in that situation? Oh, I see that face. Obey the command and continue to walk in it because the blood of Jesus has covered you. He has forgiven you, and he wants you to forgive others because he wants you to get to that place in life where you're living that life of fullness. And the old choo-choo train just keeps moving forward and you're going to get to a place where God has set you free to do that which he's called you to do because he's a God of faithfulness and he loves you so much. Oh, thank you, Jesus. It's very enthusiastic in this place this morning. Amen. So the power to forgive is so important. It's part of resurrection life. It's the third thing that Jesus does, does when he gets back to earth. He, 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 he deals with sorrow. He deals with fear. And then he says, forgive. Wow. What a picture. Amen. Number four, there's only five. Number four is this. The next thing he deals with is unbelief. And what happens here? It says, now verse 24, now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to them, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see um, in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the, into the print of the nails and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. I've written next to that, never. I will never believe, as it says in the Greek, apparently. I will never believe. Can you imagine a disciple of Jesus who've seen miracles, the dead raised, 5,000, 4,000 people fed, saying, I'll never believe. Wow, that's strong. Do you know what unbelief is called in Hebrews chapter 3, just after verse 7? It's called the evil heart of unbelief. In other words, the devil is trying to stop you from believing. Don't let him. Don't let him. Amen? Because Jesus wants you to believe. Just feed the train. Feed the old engine inside here with truth. And as you feed the old engine with truth, then you'll find that you'll be able to overcome and see God do some great things in your life. 
You may be able to stand on a platform with six or seven little kids and say, come on now, kids, let's shout freedom to everyone that feels chained up in this. It was 2,000 people in the room that day. And so these kids are all shouting, freedom! And somebody gets saved just hearing one word by faith. What a silly thing to do. I hope you told, didn't tell them you came from our church in the northeast of Scotland doing silly things like that. Oh, they know exactly where I come from. <clears throat> but Thomas was full of unbelief. But what does Jesus do in the midst of unbelief? It's amazing. Just, just amazing. Read the word here with me. It's just amazing what Jesus does. And after eight days... His disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said, Thomas, Thomas. He didn't look at Thomas and say, You'll just have to wait a while. I know your unbelieving ways. No, because he wants everyone to believe. He immediately wants to bring him into that place where he's walking by faith. You know why? Because he needed him on the day of Pentecost. I remember um, going 1984, I went to learn about faith in Tulsa, Oklahoma. First time I'd gone to the, the States, and there was this couple singing. And they sung this song. You'll never get Abraham's blessings with the Thomas kind of faith. And I'm thinking, that's rubbish. Jesus forgave him. What a stupid song. <laughs> what a stupid song. You'll never get Abraham's blessings with the Thomas kind of faith. Thomas stood on the day of Pentecost. Fire fell upon him, and he was speaking in tongues, and he was preaching the gospel like nobody's business. Amen? Sometimes some of the things that we sing, oh, anyway, I won't go there. <laughs> <clears throat> he wants us to believe. If it's a baby in Waco or Seattle or something, if it's a handkerchief you're saying, you just speak the Lord in a way, the amount of handkerchiefs we prayed over and people have been healed from cancer. In particular, bre 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 breast cancer up in Elgin. You just speak to her about it. She has tremendous testimonies of how we used to do that when we were leading the, the church up there. You just got to believe, amen? because that's the heart of God for us. Don't let go of last week and think, well, that's Resurrection Sunday over. Every day is resurrection, amen? That resurrection life is inside you and it's inside me and God wants to use that life continually. Have you ever noticed, you've said, oh, I'm not a meeting tonight with a guy, it's, English is not very good. I'll tell you, come and listen to Ahab, eh, eh, Ahab, he, he, Ahab, I better not call him that. <clears throat> he, I mean, he has, he, he's an amazing guy, amazing guy, and very worthwhile hearing the, the testimonies that he have, has about living in the Middle East, and one, he, he's, he comes from Egypt himself, lives in, in um, Switzerland now with his wife. Um, but just amazing testimonies of the things that God is doing around the world. We can't put this on the, on the screen because it, things are so monitored these days. Um, okay, my final point is this. Then there was Peter. Then there was Peter. Okay? This is a few days after the resurrection. And Jesus has appeared to him at least twice that we know. And after these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples, chapter 21, verse 1, at the Sea of Tiberias. In this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. My point is this, so often in a time of insecurity, we go back to the last place of our security. 
will just want to crawl back into the old ways of doing things. We'll want to go back to something that we've liked in the past. It's near the same nowadays. It's better nowadays. Amen. Amen. Because he's leading us from glory to glory. Amen. That's the heart of God for you and me and the resurrection life that he's given to us. I remember a time when Yvonne and I, when I first left the fishing industry, um, it was the guy that led the, the, the office that we worked with back then. He was retiring, and, and I had miss, we had missed out and, and, and blessing him in some way. So we arranged that we would go to do that, and it was a Friday. And I wasn't doing too well as a pastor back then. And I couldn't have really preach very well. And, and, uh, and I was getting a few comments, and people were wondering, well, what's your vision? And I didn't know if I had a vision. And, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I was leaning heavily on, 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 on Heather's dad, Alan Parsons. God bless him, he's in heaven now. And, and, you know, but things just weren't going too well, I didn't think. And so I'm in this place, you see, I'm around all these people in this office. And I said this, what would it take to go back fishing? What would it take? One guy looked at me and his eyes opened. He said, if you tell us today, I'll have you on a boat as a skipper on Sunday night. Oh, the temptation. And then I spoke to um, a guy called Stuart Brunton, who was like a father in the Lord, a great pastoral guy, came from Dundee. He's in heaven now. He said this to me, if you try and get onto a boat, I'll be standing at the top of the steps to stop you. That was one of the things that changed my life because I found someone that believed in me and believed in the calling of God that we had. So we soldiered on. And here we are today. Because we're not turning back to the last place of our security. You can go back there, but you'll find that you won't be in the place of blessing. So many have tried it. And it doesn't really work. It's called the place of compromise. So what heals us to finish with off? What heals us from our insecurities? You got to keep Jesus center. You got to forgive always. You got to confess continually your love for Jesus. And we got to work together in harmony. Unity. A multi generational family on mission together for the call of God in these days. Not easy days by a long shot, but hey, the light is becoming brighter and brighter. And all we need to do is just recommit our lives to the Lord. We've had bread and wine. Recommit our lives to Him, knowing that He is a God of faithfulness. Finally, finally, and finally, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus took Peter into the deep water because he wanted to teach them some lessons about how to catch fish. He wanted to teach the fishermen how to do it. So they filled two boats, and their nets were breaking. And here he is again in a similar situation. But this time, because of the resurrected Jesus, the nets didn't break. The nets didn't break, and they made a big catch, 153 large fish. They didn't break. God means for us to be a people that walk together where the nets don't break.